five minutes. Yeah. We'll start with the bell and we'll uh, okay. Everybody, good afternoon. What was that? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great. So, um, welcome uh, to the uh, the workshop you've been waiting for all day. I know you can entertain yourself for uh, lunch. You're thinking, I can't wait to get to 3:20 and get to this workshop. Um, chill. <laughs> chill workshop. So we are really excited to be here for our chill out workshop. It's a meditation for everyone. Everyone includes you. Um, I know many of you said, oh, I'm going there to make sure that my, you know, I have the resources to take care of my staff and my clients and culture. Uh, I see one person saying, self, this is the place for you because if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. So uh, put the mask on yourself first in this room. So um, we are going to be talking about different mindfulness um, meditation uh, practices with some really beautiful people on the stage. We're a bunch of huggers up here, so feel free at any point to hug. People always ask permission first. <laughs> um, uh, unless they're coming at you and you're coming right back at them. We're okay with that. So um, this is the respite before the cocktail hour. So um, we hope to, to have you all chilled out by the time you come through this. So my name is Chris Parquet, I'm the CEO of the Coalition for Behavioral Health, and we'll go a little bit more into details of our panelists um, after, but we want to get you all centered. And so I want to introduce you to our esteemed panel. To my right is Sasha uh, Parmasai, and then we have Paco Lugovina and Paul Feuerstein. Um, so we just ask that you be really present, and in a place like this, if you want to remove your shoes and bring your feet and your seats into the room, feel free to do that. You can keep your shoes on. Um, this is a very loving space and a bunch of loving people up here. There's space on the floor if you want to sit on the floor. Make this work for you. And, um, oh, wow, Paul's already starting us off timing. So, um, we're, we're, we're practicing. We're practicing up here. And we're going to um, talk a little bit about, uh, well, We'll give you opportunities at the end to ask questions and answers, but the way that this is going to work, we're going to start with an opening meditation, a uh, very short meditation in one particular style of talk is going to lead us through. Then we'll hear from each of our panelists, then Paul will close us out with uh, another uh, short meditation, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A and build a little community here. So I want to um, turn the chimes over to Paco to get us settled. So Paco, are you going to lead from the table? Yep. Okay. Excited, so many of you here. All right. Uh, congratulate yourselves for, for coming, for the, uh, for the courage to be here. Just a quick question before we get started, um, because I'm going to get started right away. Uh, how many of you have never done any meditation at all? Ooh, only a few. We have professionals here. <laughs> yeah, wow, wow. Okay, let's start. For some of you who do not have a back problem, um, if you do, just sit with your back to the, uh, to the back of the chair. But some of you sit in the front of your chair, feet planted. sit with a straight back in a dignified form which gives us a, a tone for our meditation. Um, straight back, um, not stiff, a soft belly. So we'll begin. So when you're ready, just close your eyes gently. Uh, consciously relax your eyes. Relax your shoulders.
Relax your belly. Feel yourself sitting, connecting to the chair. Your hands connecting to your lap or wherever you may have them. Sit and know you're sitting. As you become aware of your body sitting in this posture, you might become aware of your body breathing. <clears throat> you might become aware of the sensations of the breath coming in through your nostrils and going out. You might become aware of the movement of your chest and your belly. Breathing in, know you're breathing in. Breathing out, know you're breathing out. This is not an exercise in breathing. This is an exercise in awareness. Your body, your breathing has a natural rhythm. Just become aware of your breath. as it comes in and goes out. You might become aware that your mind has wandered off in thoughts, in daydreams, in planning, how am I going to get home? That's normal. Just simply note that. Reconnect with the breath. And begin again. Breathing in. I know I'm breathing in. Breathing out. I know I'm breathing out. As your mind wanders off again, as it will, just simply reconnect to the breath and begin again. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in, breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. And when you get ready, open your eyes. Be mindfulness of seeing. Be mindful of any movement in your body. And be mindful of any sound. For some of you, you who are beginners, you see that um, the exercise is simple because you're just looking at the breath. Uh, but it's not easy because all of our minds, no matter how long we've been practicing, will tend to just go off. Thank you.
thank you, Paco. And thank you all for your attention. Um, collective attention is a very powerful practice. Um, even five minutes, you can feel the difference in the room. I can feel it. I know we can feel it up here. So um, we, again, thank you for attention. Thank you for coming. So throughout the um, throughout the panel and the presentation today, I will occasionally ring the bell in the tradition of uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who, if you know, are familiar with his Zen practice, they'll ring bells throughout the day to bring us back. So even while folks are talking, um, use that as a moment to come back to your breath, a moment to what you're feeling, even if your feeling is frustration, sleepiness, just the point isn't to push your feelings away, but to be aware, to come back into this presence and in this moment. And um, so throughout the next hour or so, occasionally hear me chiming. Doesn't mean anything else other than coming back to your breath and coming into this moment uh, and suspending judgment on whatever it means to come back into this moment. Um, but for now, we're going to come into the moment um, to learn a little bit more about the panel up here. And I'm really honored and pleased to make um, new friends and to be on a panel with an, uh, another friend that I've had a long time and to be um, with our colleagues that practice in this world of uh, doing social work, social justice, um, working on housing and homelessness and anti-poverty issues. So it's, it's nice to be up here with you, to be practicing um, kind of what we do in our private life and what we use to help drive the work that we do in the rest of the aspect of our life. So to my right, I'm happy to introduce Sasha. Sasha is the um, associate, one of the directors of the Women's Initiative, in a, and she's also a lead transcendental meditation teacher, otherwise known as TM. Uh, she teaches across all the programs at the David Lynch Foundation. Uh, she has a background in as a community and cultural activist and has worked in underserved communities in New York City and was an instructor with the Baby College, Har Harlem Children's Zone, and before becoming a TM teacher, that was before she became a TM teacher. She, um, for TM, she spe specializes in at-risk populations, survivors of domestic violence at the Family Justice Centers and a few other places across the city, along with working with veterans with PTSD at the Manhattan VA Hospital and those diagnosed with mental illness at Fountain House. Um, and young survivors of commercial sex, sexual exploitation and trafficking who face homelessness and poverty. Um, she's also worked with one of our panelists up here, uh, Paul Feuerstein's organization, Barrier Free Living. She's the author of, in one of her books, I asked her to put her books out here, she's uh, the author of a poetry collection called No Poem and is dedicated to the development and individual awareness, creativity, and inner resilience in the individuals with whom she works. So we're so uh, pleased to have you here with us on the panel and um, would love to hear from you a little bit about your journey and the work that you're doing um, both uh, with TM and also how uh, meditation uh, plays a role in your personal and professional life. Good afternoon everyone. It's lovely to meet all of you by just glancing even though I don't know your names and we share that wonderful <coughs> silence. So um, a little bit, of, as you can tell from my accent, I'm originally from the Caribbean. I'm from Trinidad. I grew up in, um, in a, com a community there that was really um, you know, experiencing the trauma that we see in New York City in, in all the different um, you know, organizations that are here represented, um, domestic violence, alcoholism, you know, intimate partner abuse. So, um, even though my trajectory was as a writer, I've always used um, that um, access to meditation um, to bring it into the space of writing or in the space, into the space of being a transcendental meditation teacher, bring that self, that deep aspect of ourselves into um, that space as a healing mechanism. So a little bit about, I think, better than me speaking, I, I'll share the video of one of my students and I'll begin with that, and then I can tell you a little bit about transcendental meditation as a technique and how it's differentiated from some of the other techniques represented here today. Okay. So while she's getting that set up, um, just uh, to note that uh, all of us have a different practice up on the stage, and there are so many different practices for meditation, so this is just a sample of what's available, and I'm sure anybody on the panel, and I know there are so many meditators in the room, but there's always a way and a practice for you. So there's um, 
We're coming from different traditions up here, but they're all from the same heart. So the student that gave me the, you know, it's a privilege to be sharing her testimonial with you today, and she's actually, um, she was living within the um, Barry Free Living. She was given accommodation there in one of their residences. So that's Paul's um, organization. And I'll share her testimonial with you now. And um, I'm sorry that, you know, um, well, she couldn't be here, but I'll share it on her behalf. A couple of years ago, I was living in Barry Free flashbacks, uh, anxiety, depression. I, it was basically I couldn't control it. I began practicing TM three months ago. What I have noticed is that I am more patient with certain things. I am less reactive to certain things. So, for example, I had a very stressful situation three months ago. It was a moment that was, you know, it was a very good news, and I reacted very badly. I was, you know, very anxious, and it was, it was, you know, a very bad feeling, and I felt very depressed after that. Um, ironically, three months later, I sort of had the same situation, and my reaction was completely different. So. The problem is there. It's very serious. It has to be dealt with. Uh, my reaction to it was different. I was more grounded. I was more patient. I was more thoughtful, mindful, you know, and thinking, okay, this is a problem and you have to deal with it. But just a little bit stepping out of the, you know, the reaction, the very emotional reaction to be able to see, well, what are you going to do about it, you know? And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You'll be able to get through this. You will survive. You will go on. So that was, um, that was one of our students. So as, as um, Christine mentioned, I teach domestic violence survivors and those who experience trauma. What is, what is actually TM, though? TM is a simple, natural, effortless technique. What it does is that it takes the awareness inward. So we are transcending, it's called transcendental meditation because we're actually transcending, we're moving beyond that surface activity of the mind, that kind of, you know, that surface wave activity, those thoughts that are bumper to bumper every day, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to get here, how am I gonna, you know, I have to make this list and then I forget what is on the list, where's the list, where did I put the list? So those thoughts are kind of like that, that little white noise that's there with us all the time. And in the technique, we're just diving within and we're accessing quieter levels of the mind, quieter levels of ourselves. However, I want to say that those quieter levels are there all the time. It's just that we've kind of become kind of preoccupied with what's going on on the surface, that kind of debris, right? We've pulled out of ourselves into, um, into the noise of our lives. The silence is there. The technique is simply a pathway to access what's already with you. So it's not like, it's almost as if the funny thing about it, and about all of these techniques, it's like, you know, you're accessing what you already are, what you already have. It's not giving you anything that you don't have. It's just giving you a way to contact it, to make contact, to make that connection, establish that, um, you know, like that lens, re-experience yourself in this rich, vital way that vitality is with you every moment of the day, but we forget. We become, you know, we, we become caught up in the surface waves instead of recognizing that that depth of the ocean, that unbounded space, that freedom is there within us. In the work that we do, you know, we're, we're constricted, right? There are boundaries, we have our roles, our specific jobs, we have, you know, limits are surrounding us in every aspect of our life. But with the technique, what we're doing is that we're just reminding ourselves through this effortless procedure that we are more than what we do, we're more than our names, we're more than who we think we are. If you have, a, you know, if you have this idea of yourself, what's your, what's your everyone has a self-concept. Right? I am, this is my name, this is where I was born, this is what I do, this is who I am. But yet we all know as well that we're 
far beyond anything within that conception of ourselves, right? Like in a quiet moment, you're looking at a sunrise, or you're listening to some, you know, music, or you're looking at water, and you can actually transcend that, transcend that limited, bounded self, and recognize, re-recognize, ah, look, it's it's just me, it's just me, and 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 so that's what the sense of freedom is, and one of the joys of teaching, um, you know, not just the DV survivors, but teaching the meditation in general to, to providers as well, right, to those that are clinicians, to everyone who's within this line of work, is that we need that constant reminder that we are more, that we are, the fullness of our potential is there, and we just can just plug in anytime we want, just for 20 minutes, just plug in, do the technique, plug in, let go, and experience, re-experience that richness of what we are that's beyond all the categories and definitions of who we are, or who we think we are. Um, I wanted to read a little poem that was inspired by the work that I'm doing with um, survivors. And also, before I read it, I'd like to share the fact that um, if any of you have, uh, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, if, if you're interested in accessing and learning more about the meditation, I have a sign-up sheet because it's a real privilege. Usually, um, the technique is taught over four consecutive days. Um, unlike other practices, you know, there's a specific structure, so I'm not able to actually do a demo of the of TM with you. But we have scholarships that are available to everyone in this room. So if um, you are interested in learning more about the technique, and if you you can come and see me, and um, there's scholarships that are available, so we're really happy and grateful to be able, I am, to be able to offer this on behalf of the David Lynch Foundation to you today. And I think, um, Christy, how am I on time? I don't want to cut into, I'm okay? Okay, so I'll, sh I'll share with you a poem that was inspired by my work with um, women, because, you know, we're looking at, there, there are two colors to this kind of work, right? We see, okay, this is what has happened to them, but when I work with them, what I see is their resilience, their deep inner strength, their ability to, to, to just power through the most unimaginable stress, right? And that, that kind of power is coming, is what they tap into through the meditation, and that's where, um, that's where the relationship, you can say, is formed. And uh, it's very inspiring to work with these women, and, and so this is a poem that I wrote um, in honor of this work and in honor of them. Beloved sister, you have traveled far, and now here we are together, out of the screaming dark. There are no cobwebs in this room, only a crystal image of yourself in my heart. Look, the mud caked on your feet, it melts with my tears. Look, the scars are whispering out of your skin. How your skin glows, cleansed of memory. Look, there are smiles twinkling in the corners of your lips, bursting out of your eyes that once flooded this floor with water, 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 too much water, but no more. Here we sit now, here we sit now, 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 in the present peace of this moment, linking hands in a circle of hope for all ages, echoing through time. Thank you. Privilege of introducing um, Paco Lugovina, who um, led us uh, in the first meditation. And he's an ordained Buddhist priest in the Zen Peacemaker Order. He's a member of the Zen Peacemaker International, and he's a founder of the Hudson River Peacemaker Center House of One People in Yonkers, New York. He's facilitated numerous pilgrimages to Auschwitz, 
Birkenau and done street re um, retreats in various cities in the United States. And with Roshi, uh, and he's done that with Roshi, Bernie Glassman, and uh, Grover General, how do you say his name? Gaunt. Gaunt. And uh, he's also recently completed a mindfulness-based stress reduction training in New York and in Philadelphia, so some of you might know that as MBSR. Also an entrepreneur, Paco has launched several businesses, and he is the Chief Operating Officer of LRF Developers, Inc. He's developed hundreds of housing units and a Battery Park City residential tower. He has served in the past as Chairman of the State of New York's Mortgage Agency under Governor Kerry and was the bank regulator at New York State Banking Board for nine years and was Chairman of the National Hispanic Housing Coalition. Paco. So after all of that stuff, there, there came a day <laughs> when I said, holy moly, I think that, as Stephen Covey used to say, maybe I put the ladder on the wrong wall. <laughs> and um, it was about 30 years ago that I started saying, there's got to be a better way of delivering services to my community. I come from the South Bronx, that's where I've been all my life, 149th Street. I moved in there in 1968. No, excuse me. No, 66. 68 is when I started my business. Um, some of you weren't even born, but you know that, that area was very tough in the 60s. Very, very tough. And when someone presented to me meditation, um, a fellow by the name of Candido de Leon, who had just come out of 14 years of silent meditation, probably three years before that, um, in, a, in a Catholic monastery and had gotten his doctor's degree and is the founder of Osos Community College. So he used to come to my house and I used to say, you know, I don't think I can meditate. You know, if this thing takes out my edge, <laughs> my, my normal paranoia that I got, I'm going to get killed out there. <laughs> And he said, no, 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 in fact, this is going to make you stronger. I said, bullshit. You know, this, this, this is like La La Land. <laughs> Bringing the film forward, though, um, it, it has saved my life in many ways, meditation and mindfulness. Because although you're looking at a 78-year-old car here, it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't act that way. It doesn't behave that way. Sometimes I'm even surprised about all of that. And, you know, and I give credit to self-care. I give credit to that I have tried to watch what I eat. I give credit to the fact that I try to go to the gym and exercise, all of those things, yeah. But I give a tremendous amount of care to the fact that I was able to find Bernie Glassman for 20 years ago, and through that practice, and so let's, let's, let me see if I can demystify a little bit this business because part of the problem is our branding with meditation is pretty bad. You know, we, we, I, I, I have these ropes that if I came here, those ropes, and I shave my head where I'm, like I'm supposed to, and you guys would be running out the door. Um, mindfulness, the, the, the John Kabat-Zinn uh, who developed MBSR, Definition is the ability to be aware on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, on purpose, without attachment. A simpler way of saying that is the, the ability to see what's going on in your mind without be, getting carried, carried uh, away with it. So most of us get into the storylines and stuff like that. So this practice is about not shutting down your mind or anything. It's about, it's about becoming aware. And as the young lady said on that film, becoming less reactive to things. So an example of that is my relationship with my wife, who is a very, very tough lady for 20 years. And she's my third wife, so I think I got it right this time. <laughs> um, you know, and, and at one point I had to say, you know, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? And when I chose to be right, then I would get into this, yeah. When I chose to be effective, I got into my heart. And it, as I like to say, it's amazing how, how, how she changed the more I changed, you know. So, um, 
that's what this practice is about. Uh, I just finished my 20th year with Bernie Glasgow, so I'm, I finished my beginner's period, um, meaning that it's called a practice for a reason, but you have to practice at it. Just like I go to the gym, I have to practice meditation every day. But the reward to me is becoming a better Paco every single day. Improving my, my thoughts, uh, my actions, my words, um, so that they can become more wholesome in the way that they, they come out with my colleagues reacting less. So um, I'm gonna stop because time is the essence and you gotta hear this man. <laughs> so thank you. Rounding out our panel is um, Paul Fiersling, a dear friend and a former board member of mine um, and a real visionary and leader in our sector. He is the founder and president and CEO of Barrier Free Living and developed the first transitional residence in the country for severely disabled homeless people. It's located on the Lower East Side, um, otherwise known as BFL, fondly. It, is, it also has the largest uh, domestic violence um, program for people with disabilities in the country. And Freedom House is their first totally accessible domestic violence shelter in the country and has served victims with disabilities for over 40 states, um, with people from over 40 states and Puerto Rico. In 2015, BFL opened 120 units of supportive housing in the South Bronx. Uh, Paul has authored numerous uh, articles, including Disabled Women in Domestic Violence, Notes from the Field, for the book Service Delivery for Vulnerable Populations, New Directions in Behavioral Health. And we'll hear after Paul's presentation, um, we'll look at the experience, his practice a little bit. So Paul, tell us a little bit about uh, mindfulness and your journey. Okay. Um, I'm an Episcopal priest as well as being uh, a social worker. We wouldn't hold that against you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wish I could say that my mindfulness began out of a spiritual quest for wholeness and all of those kinds of things. In reality, what happened is I met this drop-dead gorgeous woman in coffee hour after church. And she told me she was a TM teacher. So I immediately responded, I'm interested in TM. Smart man. <laughs> Let's go out for brunch and talk about it. And I, I went through the training. Um, and there was part of me, I, I, because I was a clergy person, I had to go through a special course to prove that TM wasn't a religious practice. And I wasn't totally convinced, because there's a certain amount of Hinduism that's part of it, but it is accessible for everyone. And I can't credit TM with me getting together with my wife. It's not sort of a spiritual answer to Match.com. <laughs> We've been, we celebrated our 37th anniversary last year. And we have survived the, the, the coming of age of three adolescents. We've survived two master's degrees, one for her, one for me. We've survived multiple renovations of a house in East Harlem, and we're still going strong on that. I'm still recuperating from the last one. Uh, and it's always that sort of zen, almost zen thing of saying, do I own a house or does the house own me? <laughs> um, and I've seen Barrier Free Living move from being in a storefront in Avenue A to growing to being a storefront with a domestic violence, uh, well, a homeless shelter, and then starting a domestic violence program and creating a domestic violence shelter and then opening up 120 units of supportive housing. And there's always a certain amount of drama that goes with all of those things. Working with the city of New York in itself is a cause for drama. But I have found I, I, I can't remember the last time I missed a day where I didn't meditate. Because it's what centers me in the morning. It's what puts me in a place where I can go in and hear the crisis du jour and not be upset by what's happened. 
by all of the dramas that happen within either domestic violence or homelessness or whatever it may be. And, and that's an important piece of, of the work. Oftentimes, meditation is thought of as an Eastern mysticism piece, and it is that, but it's very much a part of other traditions as well. Uh, a colleague of my wife's, who was a TM teacher, same time, became a TM teacher at the same time she did, uh, joined a Trappist monastery in Massachusetts and taught uh, Father Thomas Keating, who was the abbot of that monastery, to meditate. And he became one of the guiding lights of centering prayer in the Christian tradition, of taking some of the same principles of transcendental meditation that he had learned and applying that to his own spirituality and, and creating something that was uniquely Christian for him and for many of the people who have followed him. And to say that it can be uniquely Christian, it can be uniquely Eastern, it can be uniquely whatever you'd like it to be, is I think an important thing for us to look at. Uh, David Gellis wrote a book called Mindful Work. Uh, and I learned about that book when I was in a, uh, about a year and a half, once a month group of mindful leaders, of CEOs of organizations, for-profit organizations, not-for-profit organizations that would come together to practice mindfulness, to meditate together, and then to look at the challenges of our work and to see how mindfulness applied to those things. And it was a very important piece because many people have introduced mindfulness to the work that they do. General Mills, the serial people, as an active group of people who practice mindfulness, who practice meditation. And it is because the chief legal officer of General Foods became a meditator and then introduced it as a practice to a small group of employees that became larger and larger and larger until there are literally thousands of people who practice mindfulness in that organization. And she was responsible for dealing with General Foods as they had to deal with the FDA and had to deal with a variety of things, had to deal with antitrust issues when they were looking to buy other corporations. And a very high stress position, but she said what kept her grounded in that in the day was the experience of meditation, was the experience of starting a day with that sense of mindfulness of, of stopping and being and what it does for concentration and individuals concentration and what it does for productiveness in work what it does for a sense of empathy of being able to listen to people and be centered in that process has to be been an amazing thing um, and we have done a certain amount of mindfulness at Barrier Free Living in general, but we have welcomed the partnership that we have with the David Lynch Foundation, where we have employees and people we serve who are going in deeper in terms of learning transcendental meditation and taking on that practice themselves. But there are times when we have started staff meetings as we started our meeting today with five minutes of just being centered, of just experiencing breath and experiencing ourselves in the here and now to get ourselves grounded as we begin talking about things. As an agency, we began the, the work of undoing racism, which came out of the Human Services Council, which came out of, my, out of my experience of being part of their undoing racism task force, which came out of my own personal experiences of uh, being a northern white person who parachuted into the south in the middle of desegregation. And my staff commented that by starting with that point of mindfulness, the tenor of the conversation, our ability to speak truth to each other was different just because we had started with that moment of centering. So it's an important thing that we do, and I wish we did it every time we had a staff meeting. Sometimes, you know, the, the haste of the day keeps us from doing that all the time. But in those moments of crisis, in those moments when we really need it, we will go back to that centering process so that there can be a sense of people being in the here and now, and the sense of saying, 
you know, we, our minds will be hijacked. We call it the monkey brain. You know, I'll be off shopping lists. I'll be off doing whatever. My wife says, that's distressing. I'm letting go of those things that I may be worrying about at a particular time by bringing myself back to a mantra, by bringing myself back to a place where I'm centered. And, you know, I've been doing this for 38 years. And it's easy for me when I hear someone, Paco, leading us through that to just sort of go to that place. Because I practice. It's like anything else. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. I would urge people even to start with five minutes a day. There's an app for that. If you have an we're Android gonna, phone. We're going to talk about that. resources at the end. Maybe, oh, okay. uh, so we'll maybe, uh, the end. maybe okay. you want to take us through. Um, Paul's going to lose their practice. Um, OK. And then uh, we have a lot of resources. Yeah, we have some resources we'll talk at the end. Uh, but we're going to go through this practice, and then we're going to take some questions. I have some questions for the panel. I'm sure you all do, too. We'll talk about some of the resources and um, how you can bring it into your life. So let's um, polish that light with the chimes. Make yourself comfortable in your seats. Be aware of your seat. Be aware of the weight of your feet on the floor. Be aware of the position of your hands. Let us begin by taking some cleansing breaths. And we do that in through the nose and out through the mouth. Imagine yourself at a gate, the beginning of a forest. Look around to see what you see in the trees, perhaps some animals along the way. Begin to walk down the path. As you walk down the path, be aware of what you see and what you smell. Be aware of the purity of the air and the breathing in and the breathing out process in your body. The path will lead you to a wise person. And you've heard wonderful things about that wise person. And you know you can ask one question of the wise person. And as you walk along the path, look around at the beauty of the nature around you, you think about what that one question might be. The path begins to get steeper as you go up a hill. turn around some corners and you begin to see the tops of smaller trees. You begin to get a greater sense of the forest beyond. And you continue on that winding path. And you come to a habitation. It's where the wise person lives. go up to the door and you knock on the door. And the wise person invites you in. The wise person invites you to make yourself comfortable to sit in a seat and 
be aware of your breath and be aware of where your body is. As you look into the eyes of the wise person and see a sense of compassion and get a sense of that person's wisdom, you ask your question, the one that's unique to you. wise person listens to your question. The wise person smiles a smile that shows even in that person's eyes. It says, give me a moment. You're aware of your breath. Going in and moving out. After some moments of silence, the wise person gives you an answer. thank that person. And perhaps you leave a gift, a flower you picked along the way, a stone, a pine cone, whatever it may be. And you leave that habitation. You start on the way down the hill. That winding way that leads you back into the forest, through the path, till you come to the gate where you started. And you take another deep breath and you smile that someone has given you their bit of wisdom. And when you're ready, take another deep breath, open your eyes, and come back to the present. So I invite you to take a look around to your neighbors, look around the room. your beloved community. Thank you, Paul. Um, that reference is a reference um, to Martin Luther King, but many of, uh, when you look at the different traditions of uh, meditation, particularly in Buddhism, they talk about the, the Sangha being community. And I would venture to say that the, the community of the people that do the work, including your staff and you yourselves, are a very strong, powerful community. And although you don't come together because of spiritual practice, you come together because of your commitment and your heart and your passion for the work that you're doing. And unfortunately, we could never pay you enough the work that you do or the heart that you bring to help people transform their lives. And oftentimes, you're working in settings where the biggest, greatest strength that drives you to do your work is the muscle of your heart, and that is the very muscle that gets taxed, that works in an environment where trauma is a daily, we use the term practice, trauma and the reactions to trauma and the things that you and your staff have to deal with um, 
when you're working with the clients to help them recover from their trauma is very taxing. And it can have, um, many of you know, uh, clinicians about vicarious trauma. So what does it mean to be working in a, in a culture, to be working in an environment where trauma is a daily part of the practice? And what can you do to continue your personal mission and to work in this world? And some of these practices of what we're talking about up here is a vehicle for trying to counter that trauma. Um, the title of the workshop uh, included, you know, chilling out meditation for everyone, but we talked about um, how do you reduce the negative effects of trauma and vicarious trauma. And, you know, having worked in the field myself, um, I understand how important it is to preserve the greatest and largest resource of this field, and that is the people that go to work every single day and never give up on the mission of the organization and never give up on your clients. But there was one person in the room that said she came here for herself, and that is the right attitude to have because you do need to focus on yourself before you can focus on many of the other issues that you have at hand or caseload, entering things into data systems and things like that. So. In the middle of all of that, you have us up here, us kooky yahoos up here, talking about <laughs> we're going to add one more thing to your list in five minutes. Five minutes, I can't even go pee. I, you know, how do I have time for that? And um, so I am going to take the moderator's privilege to ask some questions of our panelists. Um, and then I want you all to think of your questions that you have for these folks, because um, we have a little bit of time. I wanted to find out from all of you all, how does this manifest into your work life? How does the presence of meditation beyond the concept, but how does this get operationalized into the work that you do? And um, Paul, you shared a little bit about starting meetings, but I'm wondering, Sasha is eager to answer that question. So maybe some advice for how do we in this room operationalize or bring this into the space? Well, you know, we like to say that you can do TM anywhere. You can do it on a subway station, in, in the subway. You can do it, you know, while you're commuting to work on a bus. You can do it in your office because noise is not a barrier to this meditation technique. When the awareness gets pulled out, you simply come back to the mantra. Very simple and you know natural technique because the technique does not involve concentration or focus. It's about the natural workings of your mind, how your mind is naturally structured, and how your nervous system is structured. And I think that's one thing that I wanted to highlight that I realized I hadn't really mentioned and gotten into, that what, what the technique does, it's physiological healing, right? Stress is something that's like toxic stress. It's something physical. It actually becomes like vicarious trauma. It's something that we um, we take into us. So what the technique does is it flushes it out. It flushes it out of us on the level of the nervous system. So it's a physical thing. Even though it's a, it's a mental technique, it's not so much about clearing your mind. Or, it's really it's it, that that's that's not even what it is. Thoughts are a part of this meditation technique. Really what it is is about giving you deep physiological rest, rest, rest on the level of the body. And so you can do that anywhere because, you know, just the premise of the practice being that you can, if you can think, you can do this kind of meditation. So you're not trying to take thoughts out of your mind, you're not trying to control the mind in any kind of way, so therefore you could be anywhere and you can do it, even when there are noises around. Because even in a busy, you know, subway station or even in an airport, you can think a thought, right? You're constantly thinking. So if you can think a thought, then you can actually do the technique. It's that simple. So it's about integrating it. I, I mean, I hope that I answer the question, Christy, but I'm thinking that, you know, sometimes when we think of this as being something separate and outside of our lives, then we don't bring it in. What I'm trying to illustrate is that this is a part of your life. It's just like brushing your teeth. It's just like bathing, right? It's nothing, you know, it's not in this hoo -hoo special zone. No, it's just part of your life. You just do it like how you'd have your breakfast, like how you put on clothes. And the, whatever experience you're having is actually 
it's working with what you need in that moment. So it's happening for good. That's what we'd like to see. It's happening for good. Whatever the experience is, you allow it to happen. It's happening for good. It's normalizing the nervous system. It's bringing you back to center. I don't know if my colleagues want to. Paco, I'm curious how, um, from the business world, how were you able to, are there examples either with um, Greystone Bakery, with Roshi Glassman, or in your work life, how, how have you been able to, or are there examples of how this gets manifest in a 9 to 5 kind of world, or a you know, 12 to 8 p.m., or a midnight to 6 a.m. kind of world for, for staff? How do, we, how do we make place for this in our, in our corporate culture, in our structured work hours, in, in between? So a couple of examples. Uh, Bernie Glassman, who's my teacher, um, who wrote a book, Instructions to the Cook, um, and is a founder of the Grayston Bakery in Yonkers. So 30 years ago, he goes to Yonkers. He finds that Yonkers has not only a tremendous amount of high crime, uh, homelessness, um, just a city in disarray, a city that was being uh, supervised by a federal judge for housing discrimination um, and he begins his bakery and he begins his bakery and he decides that he's going to have something called open hiring meaning that if you wanted a job in the bakery all you had to do was put your name down no history no anything else so 30 years later we're doing 15 million dollars of baked goods with Ben and Jerry's, so whenever you have a Ben and Jerry's ice cream and you go to the vanilla with the, with the brownies inside, you go in the back and it says brownies supplied by the Grayston Bakery in Yonkers. Um, we use mindfulness and meditation on a volunteer basis with, with the lunch staff. And we have people who were selling drugs in Yonkers for 20 years, and people who've done 15 years in jail. I mean, we don't ask them, we just ask them if they want a job. Uh, at our board meeting, we start our board meetings at Grayston with a moment of silence. Uh, and I think it helps us center ourselves in terms of the liberations that we have to take. Uh, I work with children, I work with charter schools, I've been working for the last 15 years with charter schools, and teachers are one, one of the most stressed out, that's one of the most stressed out jobs in the world. And so we're working with teachers, we're working with students, uh, in doing the practice that has been described here. But how does it work on a, for me, you know, I mean, because to me, um, we have, we have um, in our practice, three tenets, not knowing, being open to what occurs in the moment, being uh, bearing witness, bearing witness to the joys and the, and, the, and the pains of the world, and then out of those two, taking action. And part of that action is taking care of the, of, 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 uh, of the one. And who's taking, uh, what's taking care of the one? Taking care of you. Because you are a reflection of the whole universe. And as was said before, you do not take care of yourself you cannot take care of anybody else. So, 100 years ago, I'm with Tidnan Han up in Vermont, and he's given a big speech about things, and he says, you get stressed out in traffic, right? I mean, you live in New York City, right? I said, yes. And he wrote this in another book, exactly this. He said, when you're stressed in traffic, when you're late for your meeting, when you're thinking of all these different things, look at the headlights in front of you. When the guy or the gal puts the brakes on, that's the, that's the eyes of the Buddha saying, be present. <laughs> well, you know, he messed up my life because it, it changed my life. So, you know, you can, I hope that it changes your life when you're in traffic. So that, <laughs> anyway, but you need, you need to be able to have um, practical things that help you with this practice enough. I have a 12 o'clock ring here at 12 o'clock it rings to remind me that um, that half of the day has gone by and that I want to develop peace for my kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Paco, that reminds me, because um, I've been with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh also in, in Plum Village in France, and I think it rings every 15 minutes, is that right? The clock yep. rings yep. every 15 minutes. Yep. It's a clock that has a bell similar to this, and it's a moment to bring yourself back. Yep. 
and you think, how do they get anything done? <laughs> and they do. It's an inc they're very industrious, and food makes it on the table, and business gets done, and probably quicker than it would if our minds were racing around in circles. So that um, so we're putting that on the resource list. Um, uh, we, we'll try and figure out a way if I can type onto the computer and type up the resource list as we go, but I wanted to give Paul an opportunity to answer that, and then um, I have a lot of questions, but I think maybe you all do too. So Paul, um, how do we manifest this concretely, barrier-free, nonprofit world? What, what do you have for us? To me, the, the wonder of silence uh, is important. Uh, a study was done of survivors of domestic violence in shelter in California. 97% of them said it was their spirituality that got them through the day. Whatever that may be. At the same time, they asked the staff, well, what do you do about people's spirituality? And people said, oh no, we can't talk about religion. And every one of us is a spirit-filled being in different ways. And the wonderful thing to me about silence, and when we have Thanksgiving dinner at, at Barrier Free Living, we start with a moment of silence. And I say, we start with a moment of silence that we do together to hold up our, our diversity. That we're not praying a prayer that's Christian or Muslim or Jewish or fill in the blank. And we're doing it together as a sign of our unity. And we take a moment. And that's important. It's honoring people where they are. And there was a lot of concern because we actually, I, I'm the co-chair of the Best Practices Committee for the Domestic Violence Residential Coalition. And we did training on, on spirituality and, and working with that from a strength-based perspective to say we should be asking people about their spirituality whenever they come into shelter. What gets them through the day? You know, do you come from a faith community? Does your faith community support you or does the faith community support your abuser? Which question, important question. And it's not about saying I'm trying to make people good Episcopalians. I say that's what I try to do on Sunday mornings, nine to five, Monday through Friday. I'm saying to people, support people where they are from a strength-based, person-centered perspective. And being supportive of individuals, supporting silence, supporting a spiritual path, whatever that may be, suggesting people to take five, like we took five minutes at the very beginning. That can be something that's helpful for any tradition. And I think it's an important thing for us because we're on the line, you know, we are doing tough work day by day by day. And if we're not taking care of ourselves, it's, it's easy to burn out. And to me, part of the way we work, the, the way we roll at Barrier Free Living is uh, in the work of uh, mission-based management, Peter Brinkerhoff's work, yeah. I'm at the bottom of the org chart. The org chart is more like a tree and believes where the real work is happening in a tree, at the top. I'm the support person. I'm there to support my staff. And my directors are there to support their staff. I'm there to support the directors there, and, and we support each other up the way. And our compass is our mission, vision, and values. If you go to Barrier Free Living's website, you will find mission, vision, values on every page. There's a button on the top, because that's our compass. And that's an important piece that everybody has a sense of this is what we're about. These are our values. And part of our values are about we are all spiritual beings. We all are in need of healing. We're all in need of a place where we can support each other. And that, to me, is something important. That transcends me being Episcopalian, you being Buddhist, you know, go down the line, whatever it may be to say that we, as humankind, can come together and support each other in our individual paths with respect 
we won't get in trouble for that. Try to proselytize, you know, to say, you've got to be in my religion because mine is better than yours. That's what gets us into trouble. And so, working with silence, working with a way of helping people be present within themselves as a way in which their spiritual path can grow, to me, is a wonderful gift that we could give to each other and give to the people we serve. So I want to recap what I heard. Um, board meetings are a good place, starting with the people who have not only the fiduciary responsibility, but the legal liability is the place. Can we insert a moment in our board meetings? Can we insert a moment in our staff meetings? I'm curious of the people, because we have a lot of practitioners in the room, how many people have that? Um, even whether it's called a you know, mindful moment or a, a mindful pause. How many people have a moment uh, centering for their staff meetings? Staff and clients. Staff and clients. Wow. That's great. Can you imagine what well, there's like 40 people in this room? Can you imagine the culture shift that would happen if these all 40 of you took to your weekly or, you know, bi weekly meetings a moment? center and really be present with your oh, by, oh, by the way, I work with, with, I don't work with Buddhists, I work with a Christian community, Pentecostal Evangelicals, and um, sometimes when I'm in the, in the, in the midst of, of a meeting, in the, in the charter school or the board meeting, and you're not supposed to mix, mix religion and education, but Paco will say, Pastor, will you start us with a prayer? Doesn't always have to be silence, it doesn't always have to be that kind of silence, my silence, it could be a prayer. And that centers you. So you, have, you don't have to be caught up on, on walls. You can be very creative and follow those things that you're familiar with. I love praying. I, I, was, I was born a Christian. I was educated as a Christian. I love Christ. And I'm a Buddhist. And if you don't like that, then find me. You know, but, but that's what it is. So, um... We're going to hear more from the panel, but I want to see if people have questions for our panelists about how, as leaders, they're using this. So do we have questions from the audience, feedback? And also, we welcome, since there's so many practitioners in the room, um, if you have a resource or something you uh, have experienced that you think you want to share in this room, we're here to listen. We're here to learn. So um, anybody? Sure. If you'll say your name, too. Sure. My name's Ariel. Um, I found that talk about apps in the end of this, there's a million of them. Um, this one is called Calm, so it's C-A-L-M. Uh, parts of it are free, parts of it are not, unfortunately. But um, I don't know if this is the case anymore. What I really liked about it was that um, you can access it on your phone, and at one point, I think you're able to access it on the computer, and it. Um, it could take you through like a 5, 10, 25, whatever um, meditation that's um, one that you can listen to or just simply um, select a sound of nature or, um, or and you can view like um, something of nature or sometimes it's like, I don't know, like a non-nature source like the galaxy or something like that. Um, and it just allows you to have something to focus on on your screen personally, something for the client. I've had clients say, well, I just like listening to the rain and that helps me to fall asleep and that's a focus and that's that's a, a meditation for them. Um, so I just wanted to share that. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else have, anybody have a question? Um, I, I was rem remarking when we were talking about the work that you all do every day and it seems like we keep we try to keep our spirituality or our core, our presence separate from work as if personal life never impedes and goes to work with us and as if work never comes home with this. So how many of you just walk out the door from work and be like, I'm out, I'm home, I'm not gonna think about work. So how many of you just go home and never think about work? There's like very few, right? How like how many of you leave work and whether you physically have a bag full of work but then you have the big backpack bag full of work and your heart's heavy in your head. Like, <laughs> raise your hand, that's, that's a more accurate. We can't separate that. Two-handed, I appreciate that. Two hands and a foot. Two hands and a wheelbarrow, right? Like some Sherpa carrying all the other stuff, that's, that's, and you go on vacation and you get sick because you finally let your guard down and. That's right, that's right. 
So uh, there's so much we worry about burnout. I know in the sector, so I run a coalition of behavioral health uh, providers. So we have 140 uh, member agencies and we have about 40,000 employees under our umbrella that serve 500,000 New Yorkers with substance use and mental health services. And they are dealing with some very serious work. And so although my organization does training on the best clinical practices, we do business practices, but we also have been implementing for our members more work around things like this. How do you do self-care? Teaching uh, mindfulness meditation. And I have a challenge as I've been with this organization a year as a CEO. And when I came in, the first day I came in, under my arm was my meditation cushion. And so my executive vice president has a meditation cushion. My staff know that they can go to my office whenever they want, whether or not they need to breastfeed, they need to sit down, because I'm hardly in the, ever in the office, but it's the one space that's open, that they know that they can go in, shut the door, and have a few moments of peace, whether or not they need to talk to somebody or they need to be on their own, they need to just put their feet up the wall, they want to meditate, they need to do it, they need to pump, all of those things are all open to people to have that moment. And um, I was fortunate uh, a while back to um, rent space from United Way, and what was really welcoming and interesting, uh, interesting to me, and it's a goal where we're trying to get to, and I'm wondering if anybody in this audience has this, they had in their old building at Two Park Avenue, they had a meditation room. It was a room with nothing but pillows on the floor, and it was wonderful. And so I'm wondering, any of you have those kinds of things in your workspaces? And then I'm wondering if the audience, if anybody has that kind of space, also, so I'll first take it to the panel, and then we'll take it to the audience. You know, this, um, um, first of all, that's really nice, Christy, that you invite you to your office Never there. To, 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 you know, use your cushion, their cushion. But I want to say something about, um, you know, we think of meditation rooms, like we're in New York City, where meditation is like this, you know, I mean, it's so customized, right? It's like you can get your meditation this and that and apps and, but you know, it's very, it, it's part of life. So, you know, what I tell my students, you can meditate in churches, in synagogues, in libraries, like, you know, in New York, in museums, any place that you feel safe closing your eyes and letting your body be unguarded, right? You can do that. I mean, this is a wonderful city to meditate in so many parts. You know, you can make it, once we begin to look, Trust me, you will find nice places to meditate if you have noise in your apartment. Even though you know we can meditate with noise, but sometimes we like a little to create a little zone for ourselves. One student, she was very creative. She said, Sasha, you know, I feel really weird closing my eyes on the subway. People think I'm crazy, like you know, or whatever. So she's she, you know, another suggestion if you're closing your eyes, you can put on, you know, dark glasses, put your earphones in your ears, have a book open in your lap, and nobody knows what you're doing. No, really. I mean, like, there are all of these innovative, like, little techniques that you can use. And sometimes you don't care what people think, but you just want to be in your inner room, right? You don't want them to know what you're doing. And so there are all these ways that re New York City is a very public space, right? The street is almost like your living room sometimes. But um, where we can find a place to create that little privacy for ourselves so we can meditate anywhere. And then the whole world, the whole city is open to us. It's like in an extension of our home. No, I, I find that you're absolutely right. Uh, I live in a city with a lot of noise, a lot of external distractions to compete with my internal distractions. And I, you know, we can't live in monasteries anymore or silent places like we're used to. So I just, I just find uh, for myself that I make all those noises where there is emergency vehicles or kids screaming, whatever it is out there, I make it an object of my meditation. That becomes like the food for me to know uh, noise, noise, uh, screaming, screaming. It all becomes part of who I am. So how, when do I meditate? When I meditate formally, every single morning, and I pray every single morning, and I have Native American prayers that I do, other things that I do. But informally, I meditate 24 hours a day. Where I am, when I'm walking, if I'm conscious, I, I walk consciously. And it's, it's, it's that ability to be conscious. Um, so you're absolutely right. You can do it anywhere. Uh, 
I, I, I enjoy mindfulness showers. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, you can do it. The, the one place I, I really don't feel totally comfortable uh, meditating, closing my eyes and meditating, is the subway. Buses, okay. Subways, not so sure. Uh, most of the time because I'm on the sixth train and there isn't very much room. Uh, but there are so many places where you can take a quiet moment. And I think that the importance of being able to embrace silence is an important thing. I wonder how many people found when we were doing the five minutes at the beginning or when we were doing various things here, was the silence comfortable? Was it a little bit edgy? Was it, how was that silence? Was comfortable? I, I know, I'm aware I have certain staff members who just find silence is very difficult mm -hmm. and others that embrace it. So um, back to this idea of community, if people have comments on uh, their tricks related to, um, besides sunglasses, stealth meditation in New York City, I, we heard um, one of my favorite things to do is mindful walking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. There's various techniques for um, counting as you're walking uh, to keep you back on track, counting to, you know, to 10, 10 breaths in and then Every time you lose track, you go back to one, which usually I get to two, and then I have to go back to one. Um, New York City is a fantastic place for mindful awareness on, on that piece of it. Um, one thing that I was thinking about, there's um, a saying that we hear often in my practice that they, they say, um, we get so caught up, we think it has to be that perfect space for us to do our meditation. It has to be the perfect setting. I have to sit cross-legged. I have to wear the you know fancy Lululemon pants or whatever, and like got my beads and everything. And um, it's that's not life all the time. And so one of the things that I've taken a lot of inspiration from, and and you say you talk about incorporating life into your your practice. And there's that saying that um, no mud, no lotus. No mud, no lotus. So no shit, no fertilizer, you're not going to have pretty flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to curse up here because it's too late? <laughs> All those bad things that happen in your life, you know, that the psychotherapist, you know, I've been to therapy, my therapist used to say, get rid of it. Well, the bad news is you can't get rid of that shit. <laughs> the good news, though, is that that could become the composting for the beautiful flower that you're going to become. <laughs> Pretty much the way she was saying. Yeah, and you can relax on that. So, um, I'm curious from, I guess it's, I'll target a little towards Paul, and I guess two for the bakery. So we work um, in an environment where uh, incidents happen, and we have to file incident reports, and there's protocols and practices for our staff when something occurs. And I've always thought, um, we do our due diligence. Are there any lawyers in the room? Any compliance officers? No? It would be interesting, I'm just curious, Paul, and I'm, I'm just posing this question, that when we do these kinds of incident reports, because we're a 24-hour sector, uh, our folks are on, frequently there aren't staff there overnight, you know, high-level staff, Paul's not there at 3 in the morning, he'll be there. I know Paul, he'll be there at 3.15 when something happens. It, it really it, hits the fan, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, yeah. So the question I have is, Paul, um, given the culture of Barrier Free, and I guess Papa too, and your experience too in places, Sasha, is when those kinds of incidences happen, what, what is the potential or opportunity for taking a moment to try and counter the um, vicarious trauma, that, that's inevitable, a little bit of that trauma in the, in, in the experience that we have. Is there a space for that silence for a moment? So you fill out the paperwork and then do we check in with the staff that had to fill out that paperwork? Have we trained our security people on this to take a moment to breathe for what just happened? Good question. Um, I think for us, I look at issues. I think the, the reality is we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. An important part of growth is embracing our failures and learning from them. 
And that, to me, when I think about incidents, when I think about whatever we might do, is I, I say to my staff, innovate. You have a compass. There's your, your, there's your values. There's, this is the mission statement. This is the vision. Operate within these values. If you make a mistake, if something doesn't work, my response is, what did we learn from it? Keep doing the same thing over and over again. That's, you know, Einstein's definition of insanity. But most of the really innovative organizations in the world have embraced failure to say, because it means embracing innovation. It means trying something new. It means working in a different way. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And then it's a matter of saying, what do we learn from that? And that, to me, is a very important thing. When I do orientation with interns at the beginning of a school year, we give them a copy of the mission and mission values, and I say, feel free to innovate. Don't be afraid to fail. And one of my supervisors would say, Paul, you're going to scare the shit out of all these people. Because, you know, they're going to be great at it. They're going to be, you know, they're, they're being minding their P's and Q's. They want to do the right thing. But it's important for people to have that sense of freedom to say, we're looking for good ideas from whatever level. We're not looking for it that it's just, I am the thought of good ideas and everything flows down from me. It's the other way around. And I think that's an important piece. That openness is part of what comes, I think, from being centered and from meditation. That we're, when you say, it doesn't have to come from me. It can come from anyone in the organization, and we'll honor that and we'll hold that up. Because that's how we best grow. What I found also is that you've heard the platitude that they don't care what you know. They just want to know that you care. Mm -hmm. And if you really demonstrate that, really from your heart, you as a person, because sometimes you're in a situation where you can't be teaching meditation every morning or you can't be coming into people's face and say, breathe, breathe, you know. It's, it's, it's how you show how you care for yourself and you care for others. And it, see, my opinion is that it spreads, that it spreads. And I've had people come to me and say, how do you do it? Well, then that opens a door for me to be able to say something else. To second what um, Paco just said, I think that it's about living it, right? There's a difference between speaking about meditation as we're doing here on this panel and embodying it. So embodying it means that you're meditating 24 hours with basically keeping aware of where you are in yourself, if anger is there, whatever is there, and you're not allowing that to be who you are. So that opens the space then for you always to um, embody the knowledge, to live it. And that, I think, is connecting on the human level. And it's beyond the, all the techniques. It's beyond the teaching. It's just being a human being and, you know, operating from a place of love with those around you because, you know, you, you get what you give. Great, so I have promised some resources, and I'm sorry, it's very hard to type in front of people, especially when this is at a weird angle, but um, I wanted to, I got, I, I captured some of what people are talking about, Mindful Leadership by, it's a book that I love by Janice Marcherano, and that's the woman who's at General Mills, the general counsel for General Mills, who introduced this. We have David Gellis, Mindful Work, we have Tick.com, we have Mission Based Management, um, this is a book Paul recommended, we have David Lynch Foundation, Calms is an app. We have the Insight Timer. Are there other tools? Because I, I want to have us have a mindful moment before we walk out the door, but are there? Yeah, so I would put down Bernie Glassman's book, Instructions to the Cook, because it was based on how he organized Grayston 30 years ago using um, the five Buddha families, which we will not go into. Um, uh, there's two, two apps that I also recommend. Uh, one is called Headspace, and the other one, which is kind of funny, but it has some incredible teachers, is called 10% Happier. I just like, um, as Christy's writing that up, to remind everyone, um, on behalf of the Women's Health Initiative, we have free TM scholarships that are available to the because it's a woman's initiative to the ladies in the room. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Um, 
I was trying to find a way not to say that on the microphone, but before you all dart out of here, I'm just inviting you, please come up. Usually the, the course costs $960, so this is a wonderful opportunity to um, just you know experience the practice, um, learn it. It's a 40 um, course, so please come up, there's a sign-up sheet. Okay, yeah, um, so wanted, oh, you have somebody else? You can, you want to come up afterward and talk with her. So we want to take, um, we're just at overtime. I want to take one mindful moment with three bells, all right? Can we do this? You can imagine starting your staff meeting or a really tough supervision meeting. So we're going to do three bells and then three cheers. our panel and I want to thank all of you for being present and attentive and part of our beloved community and thank you for all your work. Thank you panel.